Hello, everyone, and uh, I'm excited today to uh, jo have joined me on our final inclusion solutions of 2022. Uh, two PhD candidates, doctoral students at uh, Northwestern University uh, to talk about the science of inclusion. All of us are talking every day in our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion about how we actually get to inclusive workplace cultures, inclusive work and in, uh, environments, and inclusive uh, interactions with people in a broader society. So today we're gonna talk about uh, the science of inclusion, people performance and belonging. And I have with me today uh, Josiah Rosario, who is a PhD candidate in social psychology at Northwestern University, studying how ideologies manifest in interpersonal and social political contexts and the way that affects our identity, learning, and development. And uh, then we also have with us uh, Jordan Daly, a fifth year PhD candidate in social psychology at Northwestern, who is a member of the Social Cognition Lab and works. his work seeks to unveil the mechanisms that and the mental processes that underlie our social biases. His dissertation work is around the focus on detangling the difference between social bias and skin tone bias. And if you recognize the last name, yes, there's a connection there. Um, Jordan happens to be my oldest uh, son. So I want to welcome you, Jordan and Josiah, and I'm looking forward to the days when I, I'll be able to say Dr. Daly and Dr. Rosario. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I know those aren't far off. So I appreciate you being on with us today. And I wonder if you could just start us off on our inclusion solutions by telling us a little bit about your work. Yeah, I can go ahead and kick us off. Uh, first of all, thanks so much uh, for having us. Again, like uh, was mentioned, I am a fifth year student uh, studying in the Social Cognition Lab. Um, and my advisor and my uh, lab director is Dr. Galen Bodenhausen. And we study as a part of the Social Cognition Lab, which uh, the field of social cognition is like really broad, uh, which allows a lot of autonomy over the types of work that we do. Um, but it really refers to the way that people think as a function of other stimuli in their social settings. Oftentimes this manifests in the study of kind of interpersonal perceptions and ind individual or group-based identities and characteristics that drive various types of social biases, which kind of relates to like my dissertation topic, which is kind of trying to disentangle racial bias from skin tone bias. Um, but importantly, uh, we try to prioritize going beyond just identifying this bias, but trying to kind of unveil the sorts of mental processes that lead to them to try to inform the types of prevention or intervention sort of tactics that can be especially helpful in some of the applied settings like where many of you are working on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I'll stop there and kind of hand it over to Josiah. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm sort of honored and, pre and really appreciate the opportunity to, to be uh, in conversation with you all. So the work that I do is really on identity. Uh, as a member of the Development of Identity and Cultural Environments Lab, the DICE Lab, uh, we study how young people uh, think about who they are and how they experience the world. Um, I sort of use a number of methodologies to sort of explore how context shape identities, how sort of proximal into personal context, so one's in interactions with their peers or their teachers, um, shape their identity and learning, but also how these sort of broader distal socio-political context might shape how young people think about themselves. And their identities um, and, and sort of uh, I'd look at these processes and how they might affect young people's um, a, a sense of belonging, their their academic motivation, their uh, you know uh, overall learning and so um, uh, that that's sort of the broadest way to describe the work that I do um, but yeah. So I, Josiah I want to pick up with you because you're talking about young people. One of the things that uh, we are seeing emerge 
in the DEI space, especially around recruiting the best and the brightest talent, is that there's a disconnect, at least it seems like a disconnect, between certain generations of people. Uh, um, you describe young people. Um, but between the millennial and Gen Z's generations, and then those who are lead in leadership roles, who might be boomers and 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 Gen Xers in in the workplace, what might your work be pointing us to in terms of what we need to to be aware of, so that as you you suggested, those folks can find a, those young folks coming, young people coming into the workplace can find a sense of belonging. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, as you said, uh, m my work doesn't necessarily speak directly to this question, but sort of what I can uh, extrapolate from what I know about identity and belonging is specifically that um, sort of how young people think about themselves is shaped by their interactions with, uh, you know, people in their direct environment. So, you know, people who they work with, people who you go to school with, who you go to church with, that shapes sort of how you think about yourself. But there's also this reciprocal process that we are also shaping our environments. And so um, part of the, the, the uh, so part of what I'm taking away from that is, to your specific question is that young people also want to be shaping their cultural environments at work and that those environments oftentimes don't reflect their identities. Those environments often don't reflect um, how young people are thinking about who they are and sort of the, the, the sorts of things they want to do in life. And so I think to your question, uh, uh, I think sort of having greater alignment between one's identity and one's environment in the workplace, I think would sort of create uh, more optimal opportunities for recruiting young people. Yeah, I, I saw uh, an article um, that had the headline two days ago, um, DEI efforts stalled in 22. Here's what that will mean for attracting young talent. And and I hear what, what I hear you saying, and tell me if I'm off base on this, is that um, millennials and Gen Zs want to be able to shape their environment of belonging. We probably shouldn't say, here's what we think belonging looks like, and you need to fit in that. Am I on track with that? Exactly, yeah. All right. Uh, so, Jordan, what are some of the mental processes that you described? You meant to mention you're studying mental processes and, and mental models, if I could use that word if appropriately. What are some of the mental models and mental processes that are driving that might be driving this disconnect that you're seeing show up in your work? And how does that affect affect the social biases and the skin tone biases that that you're you're studying specifically? Yeah, I would say that two things uh, specifically come to mind. Uh, in my line of work, one of the most kind of paramount and central uh, topics is this idea of in-group identities. So who do we psychologically include versus exclude when determining the things that we, you know, are uh, consider most proximal to who we are and most valuable to who we want to be. And I think to the great credit to the young people uh, that are coming up, as well as our education systems that are, are putting them in position to learn these things, I think uh, we're becoming more and more um, aware of the multifaceted identities that we all carry. And we're understanding kind of the intersectionality of these sorts of things. And so I think one thing that uh, organizations need to prioritize is, is to heighten this focus on intersectional identities, um, increasing visibility of different identities that have historically been uh, invisible in many ways and making sure that there is space for those identities to be represented in, in the sorts of environments and cultures that maybe have uh, over time, not spent as much time centering those sorts of dynamics, centering those types of um, identities so that we allow these young people to expand the sorts of people that they are willing to and able to include in their in-group and also feel included in other people's in-group because in-group affiliation is a very, very powerful psychological mechanism mm -hmm. that leads mm -hmm. to so many sorts of um, biases and disparities. And so to the extent that we can promote this sort of psychological affinity through the expansion of, of various in-groups, I think that would be a, a powerful way to improve performance and, and belonging 
in an organizational space. Um, but in order for us to expand the in-groups in this way, we need to first understand these different sort of intersections and identities that have become centered in the lives of some of our younger people. And so that's that's one thing uh, that I would mention. Another thing that I'm kind of happy to elaborate on um, more later is that um, oftentimes when we're talking about sort of belonging um, or interactions that make people feel at home or not, um, we're talking about it kind of in a vacuum as this sort of episodic experience. And we don't mm -hmm. think so much about the, the kind of history and environmental factors that may have led up to this episode of, of belonging or considering belonging. And so I think one thing that we really need to start kind of litigating more and interrogating in our environments is like, to what extent are there kind of built in histories or environmental factors that um, impede or interfere with these episodes of like, I really want to make you feel belong, like you belong in this moment, but I'm ignoring all of these other built in associations of our environment, all of these tendencies, all of these patterns that um, actually make this one episode a lot less uh, consequential in terms of your overall feeling of well-being and belonging in a certain environment without acknowledging the sorts of built-in systems and associations um, that manifest psychologically. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that these environmental factors do manifest on an individual level psyche. Um, if we don't acknowledge those things, we really dampen the effect of even positive interpersonal uh, contact that we might have with say a coworker or a boss or, or uh, a potential boss. Yeah, there, there's so much that I wanna unpack in that. First off, we know that um, the uh, millennials and Gen Zs, this new generation of that's coming into the workforce is now represents the largest age demographic in the workforce. But we also know that we can have up to five different generations in the workplace environment. So, you know, think about that in terms of generational mental models. And then think about when we think about it in terms of the you talked about intersectionality. The other thing that we know data point that we have is that this new larger segment of the workforce is also the most diverse. So, you know, there's there what I hear you saying and help me unpack this here is that we, we need to pay attention to those barriers that might come by might, might pre-exist across those generational differences uh, based on the mental models and the mental processes that are more um, that are centered around generational kinds of understandings of the world and how we see things. And, and, and we need to do that in order to then go about doing what uh, one of my mentors in this space, John Powell talks about um, broadening the circle of human concern that then creates that sense of belonging. Am I on track with that? Yeah, I think you're on track. And to even take it a step further in terms of these kind of five generations of representation, um, I think history can really operate differently when certain groups of people in your organizations have a longer history of life than, than do some of the younger people, which means sure. that there's been a longer period of kind of association and, and building of sort of um, even sort of underlying systemic biases into these mental sort of encounters that people have. There's a lot of evidence that, for example, this this big concept of implicit bias that is so centered nowadays is a lot less related to someone's sort of value orientation or or their their internal preferences for how they want to treat other people, and perhaps a lot more related to the sorts of environments that they've been exposed to historically over their life. And so, if you take it to be true that, like, look, we've made a lot of progress in the DEI and I space. But perhaps there was a long history before this progress that kind of built and baked in certain associations that are really hard to kick in, a, in an immediate moment. Um, it becomes much more important that we look backward to like, what have we potentially uh, built associations around that might contribute to the way we treat people with these different intersectional identities that even though in, in the current more proximal contemporary space, we have a real genuine and earnest um, intention to, to, to treat positively and to include. That does not mean that we can just all of a sudden immediately eliminate the sorts of um, built up over time learned associations that still live in our minds and live in our systems and live in our organizations. 
And so I think we need to do a really good job of looking backward and looking you know, into the current spaces to see what sorts of things have been reified over time that despite our intentions otherwise are still manifesting and seeping into our interactions and, and um, in psychological encounters. Yeah, um, I, I wanna get back to that, but I wanna um, bring Josiah in here on this thing, uh, idea. When we were talking earlier, Josiah, you mentioned um, that sometimes we talk about belonging without uh, and inviting people to have a sense of belonging without actually articulating or defining what it is that you want people to belong to. Say something more about that. Say more about that. Expand on that a little bit. And what are the what are the things that um, we might miss out on if we're not paying attention to defining that what belonging really means? Yeah, that's a good question. So I sort of take from sort of critical theory and sort of thinking about the history of coloniality in this country. So, uh, you know, what does it mean to, to sort of recruit and, and to sort of want people to belong to your particular organization or your particular institution when it was created without them in mind? So uh, if you've sort of created this organization without the, the sort of people that you're sort of interested in, in recruiting and working with you, um, then, then the sort of environment that you've already created uh, is inherently exclusionary. And so sort of what I mean by that and sort of what that does to our definition of belonging is to say that belonging actually has to be reflective of people's actual experiences. And, and sort of the way that I think about belonging specifically is one symbolic relationship with the organization or their institution. So even beyond the sort of like day-to-day -day interactions, it's how people construe their relationship with the institution mm -hmm. that really matters. And if that that uh, sort of uh, symbolic relationship is negative or there's a lot of uncertainty there, then uh, there's no way that you can get beyond that, um, you know, without doing significant work. Yeah, uh, um, and, and I feel like that, flows right into this idea that that's a, a lot in vogue these days in, in in our space is we're talking about psychological safety, right? And I think like what I hear you saying is if we're not constructing uh, what one person that I quote a lot in my training says, we need to create new spaces of inclusion rather uh, uh, than inviting people into existing spaces that we're trying to make inclusive. Does that resonate at all? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so it, it sort of means we have to re recreate and, and sort of uh, dismantle and, and build up and imagine new ways of being, new forms of engagement with each other um, yeah. that don't rely on old systems, don't rely on old, you know, cultural ideologies, don't rely on, on sort of these larger historical. Uh, so, so maybe the boomer boomer uh, leaders and managers have to learn how to manage remotely because that is, that feels very natural for their their millennial and Gen Z workforce. Am I am I hitting the right tone there on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, our last uh, uh, inclusion solutions we we heard from the uh, David Livermore, the author of uh, Digital Diverse and Divided, and I was talking about the fact that that that's a real. I spoke with them about this idea that th that digital thing is a real thing when you start to look at the differences in the, how the workforce might engage in a remote setting versus a. Um, an in-person setting, you know, there's a, a little more natural uh, affinity to that remote setting uh, or, or a comfort level, I, I probably. And um, I, I quote, I always tell a story when I talk about this in my trainings about um, watching uh, my two young, my two sons text across the room to people. And and I kind of try to figure out what why just go talk to the person, and then I realized it's a different way of communicating. There's nothing better or worse about it. It's just different. So my mental model says real communication 
happens when you're talking directly to someone. But that's not necessarily a mo mental model or a process that I need to generalize and expect everyone to uh, 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 associate with or accept. Uh, am, am I going down the right path here in terms of what your work is suggesting in terms of creating new spaces of belonging? Either of you can jump in on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say really quickly. Yeah, I definitely think so. I think, um, you know, even beyond the sort of digital and sort of communication based interactions, there's the sort of, um, you know, how do we expect young, how do we expect people in the workforce to engage with uh, leaders and author people in authority? What's the sort of language and decorum and sort of etiquette that we expect people to to sort of behave in? Does that need to be rethought of and, and reimagined? Um, I think there's so many other uh, sort of interactions and, and uh, sort of realities within the organization that, that can be reimagined along this along this line. And sort of, and I, I sort of mentioned that because it it's to say that no sort of you should leave no stone unturned that 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 you should sort of be willing to think about every aspect of your organization as ha being able a a as sort of having the potential to be reimagined but uh, yeah, yeah. i like that term reimagined because it it i think it gets us beyond it's not just rethinking you know it's it's really expanding our imagination asking the what if question well what if we do this differently um are we are we sure we're not going to get good results and just asking that what if question to be able to again widen that circle of of concern and interaction so um do you have anything you wanted to add on that jordan yeah, I guess what I would say is that um, I think a lot of these initiatives can be taken on at an organizational level and can be implemented and there can be a big initiative toward it. But I, I just want to kind of caution and, and have a reality check that like there will still be imperfect implementation of it. And there will be moments when we've we've put together this policy with these people in mind and and they've approved of it. They've they've stamped their approval on it and say that they're on board. All of the people of our organization are on board. And yet, say our our minoritized fact, uh, staff members are still feeling, uh, you know, issues with their belonging, issues with their, uh, you know, interactions with their coworkers and whatnot. And again, I think this comes back to this whole idea that like, just because the intentions are there, and we we've gone around about the right process, it does not mean that some of these biases that we have kind of ingrained in us um, or have, have been associated will not uh, boil back up in certain sorts of spaces. And so I just wanted to highlight the, the importance of kind of continued vigilance, um, continued self-reflection, um, paying attention to our histories, um, both the, the temporal and spatial histories that are currently, you know, in your environment, but also the ones that come outside of those spaces that people bring in to their spaces, perhaps from their own histories, from their own uh, experiences, their own upbringings and stuff like that, because we're all individuals who are not born in this organization and likely won't die in the organization. And we, that means that we come with things from outside that that warrant our attention, I think, in some circumstances. And so um, I both want to like wholeheartedly um, support kind of this reimagination thing while also, you know, bringing us back to the reality that like that doesn't mean it's going to be, care, uh, you know, carefree and perfect as you move forward. And so organizations right both have to be prepared to reimagine and then you know put in the continued work to kind of retain that positive progress and retain the sorts of feelings that you know those those reimaginations uh represent at their at their pinnacle at their best you know so so we should avoid this when we talk about the science of inclusion we should avoid this idea that we're working towards a singular endpoint am i accurate in, in exactly. saying that and, and continue to all, to continue to learn as organizations, to con continue to challenge our, our staff and our colleagues to continue to learn so that whatever the, the social context that arise over time, whatever the lived experience of someone who comes on staff that's new, is that we can, we can learn and develop ways to interact with that person that it aren't driven by our social biases am, am i on on target with that 
That's right. And I think being able to acknowledge that really uh, presents the opportunity to, to take it on as kind of a, a corporate collective effort rather than something that one individual is responsible for resol resolving in themselves as something that, oh, this is a trait, an attribute that an individual has that perhaps is distasteful. Instead, we're acknowledging that holistically, we all bring a lot with us when we come to the work. And, and as, a, as a company, as an organization, as a group, we've prioritized um, leaning into the sorts of things that everyone is bringing to our environment and acknowledging the sorts of psychological, um, sometimes baggage, but also sometimes just uh, realities that come with having a diverse workplace. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's really, I, I think that's really being reflected in some of the work that and interactions I'm having with with companies is that sometimes uh, we we've tended in the past in what is now being called the um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion industrial complex. We do these trainings. We drop these trainings into the workplace, and we send people to these trainings. And then, miraculously, without any um, exploration of how the systems within the organization, or maybe even the space itself, the physical space is designed. We don't think about that, and then we expect people to miraculously change and become different. Um, can either of you speak to that a, a little bit? Yeah, I, I could I could jump in there just really briefly. Um, you, your organizations and your discussions is not the only place where this kind of DEI training uh, mechanism, this machine of come in, resolve all of our issues right now, and have it have it be done for and in the back, you know, on the back burner is is also in the academic space. And I'm I'm grateful to a lot of the awesome work that's happening that can kind of speak to some of these things. And one thing that I'll mention that I think pertains to the sorts of diversity trainings that we see is that, um, you know, the way we describe these biases and the, the way we frame them in terms of their manifestation, I think are really important to um, creating a training, creating a conversation that people are actually receptive to. Uh, one paper that I've read recently describes like this idea as, of a implicit bias as as actually the cognitive residue of past and present structural inequalities. And I think that that's a really like powerful way to think about this idea of implicit bias, because rather than something that an individual possesses and is guilty of, it, it speaks a lot more to the sorts of environments that they've been exposed to and the way that those environments have socialized them. And it also speaks to the power of your own organizations and your own environments in the way that you, if you shape them correctly, can have these downstream psychological impacts on your individuals that you're working with. It also frames these sorts of biases that might be manifested by well-meaning egalitarian oriented people as more of a behavior rather than an attribute. Yeah, you know, like yeah. I acted in a way that was biased implicitly. It was unintentionally biased. I was not even aware that I just did this. And, and that makes it a little bit more, I think, approachable to resolution, right? Like it's something that I can work on that behavior rather than this like inherent thing that I possess that people have framed as a part of who I am, which I think sometimes uh, that's the way that these 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 trainings are pitched are like hey we all possess these biases and they're deeply ingrained and they're very hard to get rid of those sorts of things if we can one recognize the sort of structural nature of them and environmental nature and then two think of them as behaviors that we can actually be aware of we can prepare for we can put uh, kind of like prevention practices and tactics in place for I think it, it becomes a lot more of a tangible pro progress or project for our organizations and the individuals within the organization. And, and maybe more manageable for me as an individual. Yeah, exactly. Um, to, to be actually to actually begin to identify what is it that I need to change to be um, to not have my bias impacting my the, my interactions with people. So I I. I want to be respectful of your time here and i know we're we're running close on time i i wonder what do you say uh that you see that you're learning in your um research about how identities that we bring into our our interactions with others as individuals and the the structures and organizational systems that ex exists in our workplaces, our organizations, and our companies. How can, what, what is it that we need to be most paying attention to on both sides of the, 
organizational science of inclusion and the behavioral science of inclusion to to quote you jordan what what are the two what are some what what is one key thing maybe that we need to be paying attention to on each of those sides maybe if you want to take the behavioral since you raised that jordan and josiah i'd love to hear what you think about that organizational piece, because you talked about how we are we're operating in systems that were not necessarily created for the people that we want to be a part of those systems. Do you want to go first with that, Josiah? Yeah, and uh, I think this actually connects to sort of what Jordan was just saying in sort of the last question. But um, you know how we think about the solutions to a problem is really telling about how we think about the problem. And so sort of these like silver bullet suggestions, silver bullet solutions for things that um, actually deal with human beings doesn't work because we're dealing with human beings. And so I say that to say that part of what the the part of the the you know the challenge for organizations at the structural level is that uh, you have to create humanizing systems, humanizing experiences, humanizing cultures. Um, that allow people to be full human beings, right? An implicit bias training or sort of these one-off sort of trainings doesn't really give this, you know, the, the the sort of complexity and nuance to what it means to be a human being. That I, you know, the, the, and so and so that's what I would suggest is how do you make your organization more humanizing for everyone? Um, and I, you know, it's a very broad and you know, difficult question to answer, but it's one that I think uh, we should all be wrestling with. Yeah. So do you have one thing if I'm starting out, if I if I buy what you're saying, Josiah, and I, and I go, yes, 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 which I do. I believe we need to become more human centric in our approach. Um, you know, DEI at the end of the day, and I, I say this all the time, diversity, equity, and inclusion at the end of the day is about people bottom line. So you need systems that support people that are oriented towards people. So what's one thing I'm trying to build that out next year in 2023 in my organization? What's the one thing, Josiah, that I sh that your research, your work is saying, pay attention to this? Yeah, um, I would say, uh, you know, that people have families. I think that this is one of the things that um, you know, I'm learning from my own work and sort of thinking about the the sort of culture of colleges and universities, but sort of thinking about the, the larger American sort of society is very individualistic. And so we often deal with people as if it's just them. Mm -hmm. And part of creating a more humanizing environment for people is to acknowledge that they have families that and that those families are important for the work that they do, for how they, you know, imagine purpose and meaning in their lives right. and when you sort of deal with people as if it's just them then that creates dehumanizing experiences for people mm. Mm. i would and, say and, definitely one of them and, and jordan to you on the behavioral side what what what's the one thing yeah so i guess the first thing i'll say is i don't want to bite off more than i can really contribute if i had the one thing i think i would be making big bucks right now, uh, selling it to every person who has an ear. But what I will say, first of all, is I think what Josiah mentioned is super, super important. The other thing is I think just behaviorally, we need to reconceptualize this project as being something that we can cross the finish line on versus not cross the finish line on and think of it more as an ongoing process and, and have this kind of acknowledgement that there are ways behaviorally that we can build in safeguards and prevention tactics to cover up for some of our blind spots, prepare for the moments where we perhaps fall short, understand that there might be difficult, challenging encounters in this whole project of, uh, of integrating a, a diverse, uh, equitable and inclusive sort of environment. And that even those people who have kind of checked off that I, I care about diversity, I have a diverse friend group, I am, you know, oriented toward all of the welcoming sorts of ideals that, that are typically discussed in these spaces, even those people have have associations that can be damaging. Even those people, when they attend to something like racial bias, can have other sorts of biases seep into that. And so understanding that the sorts of actions that organizations and individuals in the organizations can take to build up safeguards, to build up a, a community of open, honest conversation 
um, that can that can deal with these sorts of moments, um, I think are really important. And and I think behaviorally, what what it really boils down to is a willingness to to kind of to listen, to be vulnerable, and to acknowledge that even in our best days, even when we're putting forward what we think is our best effort toward D and I, there are things in the environment that can seep in and 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 um. And, and relate to sort of unwelcoming experiences and in the way that people like you and others in, in organizations can help to kind of combat that is to talk amongst your groups about the sorts of things that we think we can be comfortable with as a, as a response to some of these challenges, as a response to the reality of the sorts of systemic organizational structures and associations that have just built into our broader society um, that can sometimes come into our organizational spaces. Um, and I think that each organization will develop different practices um, toward that end. Um, but, but I think that there is um, a lot of opportunity to center those sorts of dynamics more so than have been um, overall, so. Wow, that's, that's uh, so I'm, I'm glad we have this recorded because I'm to go back and listen to you all over and over and over again to make notes uh, for the kinds of things that we try to help people to, to do um, as they go about doing what we call around here, creating great inclusion. I wanna thank uh, Jordan Daly, uh, fifth year PhD candidate in social psychology at Northwestern University and his colleague and uh, uh, Josiah Rosario, at, uh, who's also in the social psychology at Northwestern University, studying this science of inclusion, what it looks like, how it plays out, how does, where does um, our lived experience, our intersectional uh, identities, how that all plays into belonging and purpose and performance. Jordan and uh, Josiah, thank you so much for being on the Inclusion Solutions. I appreciate you being here. Thank, thank you, you for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.